I forgot to mention we've moved to gluten-free communion, so if any of you were uh, risking it today, you should be safe. Um, we did move to gluten-free communion a couple months ago and uh, making sure that everybody can partake without any concerns that way. It's the month of February already. Um, if you missed last Sunday, you missed an amazing Sunday. We had our, our Sunday brunch. I would argue that that was more communion than what we just did right now, uh, but today was pretty amazing too. Um, I'm excited about the possibility of doing uh, another one here, maybe before summer breaks, um, but we had a great, great Sunday last Sunday. Stacy shared a bit of her story, and it was really powerful. If you missed it, go check it out on YouTube. Uh, you're going to want to hear Stacy's story. It, it is a little hard to believe we're already into February. Valentine's is just around the corner. If you um, uh, fall prey to the commercialism that is Valentine's Day and you're a sucker who's going to spend 120 bucks on roses on Friday, then good for you. Um, <laughs> we'll do dinner a couple of days later and save a bunch of money. But um, uh, it, it's hard to believe that we're into February. Christmas, I don't know about you, but Christmas seems like a long time ago already. Like, can you think back to what your Christmas holidays held? What were the things that you, you know, the traditions that you either started or the things that you, you know, keep going year after year? Uh, we have a couple of traditions that we um, carry on every year. We did pull it off this year. Um, Christmas Day for us as a, as a family, as, as an immediate family, we stay in our jammies all day long. The kids get new jammies for Christmas. And then uh, when they were younger, it was, we felt like we were really sneaky because we would go tobogganing or skating and we would just put the ski pants on over top and nobody knew that we were out in our, in our jammies. And now that the kids are bigger, we still went out in our jammies and went skating. Um, but now we didn't have ski pants over it, so we just looked like everybody else who goes to Walmart in their pajamas. But... <laughs> One of the other traditions we have is uh, I love watching A Christmas Story. Um, now, this is one of those movies that you either, probably you either love it or you hate it. Um, it came out in the 80s, but it's kind of set in the like 50s and 60s. Um, you, you might remember, you know, it's the, like, it's the classic narrated tale. Ralphie is the kid who has just one Christmas wish. He wants the Red Rider Carbine Action 200 shot range model air rifle. But he famously keeps hearing the phrase, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. How many of you know the film I'm talking about? Like, this is, okay, some of you, okay, good. Um, it's one of those, like, you either love it or you hate it kind of Christmas movies. And if you're like me, you've, you've watched it multiple times, almost every year. Um, you'll remember there was a scene, one of my favorite scenes. Um, the, the car has a flat, and Ralphie's dad gets out to go and change the tire. And mom suggests that maybe Ralphie could go and help change the tire. And he thinks this is the greatest day ever because he finally gets to be with his dad. He gets to do some manly things. And his dad was one of those guys who like saw himself in a pit crew in the Indy 500. Like he was going to change the tire super fast. So as dad gets out of the car, he says, time me and the heads out into the dark and into the snow. And if you remember the scene, Ralphie is there beside the car holding the hubcap that he might catch all all of the um, lug nuts as his dad is taking them off. Now you'll remember the next scene, maybe. Uh, Ralphie is sitting in the bathroom with a bar of soap in his mouth. <laughs> now, how many of you had your mouth washed out with soap when you were a kid? Oh, there's a certain, there's a, there seems to be a generation gap where uh, that started and stopped. I might be one of the last ones who remembers getting their mouth washed out with soap. I remember. I remember my mom did it only on occasion. It wasn't like, I don't want to out her too much today, but uh, I remember one time though, she got, she decided to get a little, I don't know if we were out of soap or she just decided to get a little bit more creative and up the ante. And she started using, now I'm not sure how to say this. I don't want to like embarrass my mom too much. Um, she may or may not be sitting in the room right now, but um, I actually don't know how to say this word, but she used Worcestershire sauce. Yeah, right? Now you really feel sorry for me. Um, I, I remember, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to say this to you. Just say it. Wish to sir. Um, I, remember, I remember getting in trouble for saying bad words as a kid. I remember one time uh, on the playground, I, I said the S-H word, and I, I said it really quickly, and all the kids around me were like, oh, you're told on by the principal, and I was like, oh, no. I'm gonna die. And I was like, I said shoot, I said shoot. I think I was in grade one when that happened. But I remember getting in trouble for saying 
bad words. Certain words were way worse than it. The, the O fudge was probably one of the biggest ones. But when I, when I think about some of those words that we used to say or that we got in trouble for saying, I think there are, there are words that like we, we've decided are too difficult to say or we've decided to like eliminate them from our vocabulary. And so before we get into the season of Lent, I'm not talking about the F word today or I'm not talking about any of those words, but I do want to talk about some words that are maybe tough for us to swallow. There may be words that we as a society or we even as a church have decided to put on the back burner. Maybe we don't say them very often. Maybe we don't use them. We don't refer to them. They're words that have become tough for many people to swallow. Like for some, they're words that they just don't use anymore because they've, you know, the meaning has been hijacked by somebody else or it's a word that's become maybe a little bit too loaded, too full of nuance for regular conversation. I remember having conversations with people where like even the name pastor for me sometimes is a bit of a challenge to tell people that that's what I do. Um, I have a friend who instead of saying that he pastors, he's like, I exist to make people's lives better. Um, that that it, as soon as they hear the word preacher or pastor, some people have this like negative connotation or you feel like, you know, like, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not that kind of Christian. Like you feel like you have to, you know, sort of qualify at some of the words that we use. And I want to talk about over the next couple of weeks, some words that we have maybe tried to qualify or we've decided just aren't all that cool to use anymore. But I'm not sure that we can toss them out. They're words that while some churches may not focus on them anymore, I can't find a better modern equivalent to, to put in place of some of these words. So some of the tough words that I think we have difficulty swallowing, and one of them that we're going to look at today is the word sin. The word sin, I feel like, is one of those words that we don't, we don't talk about it all that often. And even when we talk about sin, we talk about like, oh, I made a mistake. Or uh, we, we don't use the word sin. Like, uh, I don't know the last time I went up to somebody and said, like, I've sinned against you. Uh, you go in with an apology and you make excuses or, or you explain yourself. But to just actually call something sin is maybe a little tough for us to swallow. We're going to look at words like repentance. What does it mean to be people who turn away? What does it mean to be people who confess their sin and repent? And what does it mean to be people who are righteous? What does it mean to live in righteousness? So those are the three words we're going to try and tackle. And, and my prayer is that these messages will kind of stir our hearts a little, uh, cause us to think maybe a little more deeply about our own condition and prepare us for the season of Lent that we're going to enter into, uh, where we examine ourselves getting ready for Good Friday and Easter. But this morning I want to talk about the word sin. And when you first heard that word today, I'd be curious to know what started rolling through your mind. Uh, were there specific um, behaviors? Were there specific things that we were like, oh, I wonder if he's going to talk about this? Or was it like, oh, pack your bags, here we go, like we're going on a guilt trip? Uh, like, what was the first thing that popped into your mind? What, what sense did you have in your heart, in your spirit? What, what sort of was the feeling you had when I said that word? Maybe you had a physical reaction in your body. You heard the word sin. You were like, what did he just, did he just say that word? Maybe you could humor me for a second. If you're comfortable, I'm going to invite you to just, if you feel safe in this place, would you close your eyes for a couple of seconds? If your feet aren't already planted firmly on the floor, could you just take a moment to do that? And then just notice the rest of your posture. Notice how you're sitting. Are you, are you leaning back, relaxed in your chair? Are you leaning forward? Are your hands folded? Are, are you across your body? Just notice your posture. And are you sitting that way because you're relaxed? Or are you, are you feeling a little tense at the mention of the word? Or the situation that you find yourself in? Maybe even just being in this space creates tension for you. Are your shoulders up and tight? Or are you feeling just open and engaged? Can I invite you to just take a deep breath? In and then out in and then out and I want you to take note of your thoughts and your feelings in this moment and does anything change when I say the word sin you can open your eyes come back to this moment what images rolled through your mind when I said that word what what feelings what thoughts what what did what reaction did you have to that word because sin is one of those words that has kind of fallen out of fashion 
uh, especially in the last few years. It used to be the buzzword for the evangelical church, and it still is in some circles, if we're honest. But we love to talk about how sinful the world was, or, or how we were sinners in the hands of an angry God, that, that God was going to smite the world for all of its evil. And in fact, much of our evangelism leaned heavily on the idea of first revealing to people how broken they were and how sinful they were, and then calling them out of that to turn away from their sin. But the climate around us has changed, and and sin means different things to different people now. And some of the authority that the church had maybe, you know, 50 years ago has waned a little bit. So there's, you know, we've been in the news for some not great things, and, and there are people who are like, well, I don't know if I can trust your definition of, quote, sin anymore. So when people hear that word, some people just dismiss it outright, that it's not even a thing. It's just this list of stuff that the church has made up to make us feel bad because some angry dude in the sky is keeping track of all of our behavior. And so we've tossed out the idea of sin. Not all of us, but some have. And we've just said, well, to each his own. You know what? You do you. There's no real consequences for our action. And I'm not sure that that's helpful. I'm not sure that that's the best way for us to not only interact with with God, but with each other. But I'm also not sure that we should double down on some of our tactics. Like that we should just dig in our heels and preach louder about the mores of society. That we should just be like, no, 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 this is sin, you are evil, God hates you, Uh, get right or get left. That's some of the language that some of my friends have heard from the church. And I'm not sure that that's all that helpful. So I don't know that we can just toss out the word sin, but I don't know if we can talk about it the same way we've talked about it in the past. Maybe there's a little more nuance. Maybe there's a little more uh, understanding to be had around this word. Uh, I love Barbara Brown Taylor. If, if you're familiar with any of her writing, she's an Episcopalian minister in the States. Um, she wrote a great book that I recently read called Speaking of Sin um, that has helped inform some of my thoughts around how I could talk about sin in a way that still um, not only recognizes the, the rich tradition of the church, but also engages with a society that's not as concerned about the rich tradition of the church anymore. And she's written a lot of really great books, and she, she explains in her book why she's a little jumpy around the language of sin. She says, I'm aware of what an exclusive and sometimes abusive language it is. In the first place, it only really works with the initiated. This is really important. It only really works with the initiated. That is, with people who've already bought into a worldview that includes a heaven, a hell, and a God who sends people to one place or the other. For people who've never been initiated into that worldview, or who have lived there and have left, the language has little power, except perhaps as a deterrent to faith. People hear the guilt coming and they leave the room. They are tired of being judged and threatened by Christians who say, love, but then do fear. So at the risk of being a deterrent to people's faith this morning, I do want to talk about sin. But I want to recognize that the way we've talked about it hasn't always been helpful. The people who aren't initiated into the language of sin and salvation may hear it and just hear, well, I'm not interested in the guilt. I'm not interested in your list of do's and don'ts. I'm not interested in this particular worldview. It has little power and it may push them farther away from faith because people are tired of being judged. They're tired of hearing Christians say, I love you, but you're garbage. And that's what we've communicated to a lot of people outside of the church. I love you, but you are so broken and so messed up that it's a wonder that God even loves you. That's maybe not what we mean to communicate, but that's what people hear. Perhaps we need to have a little more well-rounded understanding of what sin is, so that it would allow us perhaps a third way to engage with people who are not initiated to this worldview. We learn very early in Scripture that sin is real, that sin is in our existence. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was good. Everything was perfect. And God and humans enjoyed perfect communion and community. There was no separation. It says that they were naked and they felt no shame. There was no brokenness. Everything was perfect. But in the first couple of chapters, we realize that, uh, that, that the serpent is going to tempt 
um, Adam and Eve, that there's, there's going to be this rebellion that is going to happen, that they're going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a tree that they had been commanded not to eat from. In Genesis 3, 6, it says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. They'd been commanded not to eat of the fruit of this tree. And when Eve saw that it, was, it looked desirable, not only because it looked good to eat, but also that it would re- mean that she would gain wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Their eyes are opened and they realize good and evil. Man and wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But God called out to them, Where are you? And he answered, Man answers, he says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It's interesting, one of the first things that sin does is makes us afraid. And we hide. Adam, after he sinned, says, I was naked, so I hid. I was afraid. And God says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And the man, like every other human being, says, the woman you put her with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. That's that's the second thing that sin does for us. We don't take responsibility for our own actions. It's always somebody else's fault, right? The the devil made me do it. Uh, I was really tired. Uh, My blood sugar was low. Like, we have have all of these excuses, and it's never our fault. The woman you put here with me. And the Lord said, what's this you have done? And I wonder if you can hear the the heartache in that question. Do do you know what you've done? Like, do do you realize what now has to happen? They're banished from the garden, not before God slaughters some animals and makes some clothes for them, though. Interesting, the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Sometimes when we get talking about sin, we fall back into some of that language that hasn't been all that helpful. That we see God somehow so angry at sin that he, that he can't wait to punish us. And sometimes people's image of God has been this, this angry man in the sky who's just waiting for you to screw up so that he can come down hard with his discipline. We, we move so quickly to his wrath and judgment. We recognize that he hates sin. And you'll find this phrase in sinner, God hates sin and he hates sinners. The, 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 those who do evil will be punished if you read through scripture. We find those phrases in the Bible, but, but we forget that even when mankind disobeyed, God sacrifices to cover their shame. We forget to recognize that the, the sacrifice of Jesus covers over that stuff. That God's love was so great that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. That God still cares for them, even in their sin, even in their rebellion. They didn't cease to become his beloved creation. And there's a branch of theology that, that would claim that he, his wrath is so much greater than his love for his creation. I don't buy that. I don't see that in scripture. I see that even the moment after they broke relationship with God, he asked, do you realize what you've done? I have to send you out of here, otherwise you're going to eat from this other tree and you're going to have eternal life. You're going to become like me, yet having sin, and I can't have that happen. So he closed them and he sends them out. But he doesn't leave them to their own devices. Throughout scripture we see God reaching out to humanity. But sin is a real thing. It's come into the world and and not like not everything is good anymore. It's not all just perfect. We're now aware of evil. And we tend to be drawn to it on the regular. Our hearts tend to lean towards evil more often than it does to good. Sin has caused this separation, both from God and from each other. We blame each other. We make excuses for our behavior when we hurt one another. 
You see, when we look at what sin has done, it's, it's caused us to be removed from the immediate presence of God. It's caused us to be, to be pushed a little bit outside of his perfect grace and mercy. But we also see in Scripture that God, in his goodness, continues to reach out. But he's holy. So there's stuff about us that needs to change in order to be in his presence. And when we read in the next book, Genesis is where we read about uh, the creation story. In Exodus, we meet Moses, who is the great deliverer of God's people. God calls a people out of slavery. He's going to make them to be a blessing. And he uses Moses to deliver them out of Egypt. And when God calls Moses, he does it in, in this really unique way. Moses is out looking after his father-in-law's sheep, and he sees this bush that's on fire, but it's not being consumed. It might not have been all that unusual to see a, a bush on fire in the middle of the desert, but this bush wasn't being consumed. And Moses says, I'm going to go over and see what this is all about. And we pick up in Exodus 3, verses 5 and 6, where God speaks out of the bush. He says, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. There's something about God's presence that he had to warn Moses, don't, don't come any closer place you're standing is holy ground. That's what holy means. It means it's, it's separate. It's completely other. It is sacred. And it's interesting that Moses hid his face. Adam and Eve hide from God. Moses feels like he has to hide his face from God. That, that sin has somehow separated us from God's holiness. So God attempts to bring people back into relationship. He gives them the law. He teaches them about proper sacrifices in order to restore what's been broken. They have the, the Day of Atonement where they place all of their sin on the scapegoat and they send it out into the wilderness. That They, they make sacrifices that the, the blood of a, of a dove or of, a, of an animal would cover over their sin. That they might be brought back into relationship with God. In Leviticus 11, 44, it says, I'm the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. Do not make for yourselves, uh, <clears throat> sorry, do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. This command to consecrate yourselves and be holy is something that we've, we've as followers of Jesus, have taken very seriously. It's been the attitude I've taken towards sin in my own life, that, that God's commanded me to be more like Jesus. God's commanded me to be holy. So, so I want to rid my life of anything that taints my heart or my mind or my soul. But the trouble I've run into over the years of doing this is I never seem to run out of things to have to remove from my heart. I always seem to find some darkness lurking, something, some area where I've fallen short. But what also has been challenging is determining what's sin and what's not. I, I mean, the big ones are covered off, right? The Ten Commandments. I know, like, I'm not supposed to murder anybody. You know, I'm not supposed to, like, create false idols. But, but what's a false idol? When have I moved beyond, ad, you know, admiring something to worshiping something? Excuse me. Like, depending on who you hang out with, the answers to what is sin may vary, sometimes wildly. And everyone is pretty sure they have the right definition of what sin is. There seems to be little awareness that their definition might not actually be the same as what God's definition is sometimes. Like, without getting too political this morning, this past week, President Donald Trump was acquitted by the Senate on both articles of impeachment. And Christians in the U.S. are divided over this president like perhaps no other in recent history. For some people, Trump is God's man. For others, he and his policies couldn't be farther from the ways of Jesus. Some people look at what's going on and say, like, this is good, while others would call it sin. Some see a saint, or at least somebody standing up for godly values, and others see a power-hungry sinner. Depending on who you hang out with, your definitions might vary. 
depending on the church that you attend, your definition of sin might vary. I have friends who would consider the fact that I have not used the King James Version of the Bible this morning to be sin. Le- legitimately, they're not, like, that, that's their, their definition. The only true and right translation of Scripture would be the King James Version. So depending on what church you attend, depending on when you started attending church, your definition of sin may vary. Some of you remember that there was no way you'd be caught dead in a movie theater. Because if the rapture happened, they have rapture-proof ceilings and you're stuck there. We laugh, but some of us lived in that. Depending where in the world you attend church, your definition of sin may vary. It doesn't take long to get confused about how to deal with sin. And, and unfortunately, the Bible doesn't give us definitive answers. There's not a checklist at the back of your Bible saying, avoid these 232 things and you will have kept your way pure. Like, we know that lying is wrong, right? For the most part, some of us are like, yeah, we've been asked questions, we've had to lie. Does this dress make me look fat? Um... <laughs> I mean, so, but go to scripture. Rahab, she protected the spies by lying. She she protected the spies, and she was spared. She became one of Jesus' great-grandmothers. We see people who, not always prescriptive, let's be careful. It's it's not saying that God was saying, like, yes, it was, like, I I wanted, I needed a liar. Um, When we think about our own lives, sometimes it gets complicated when we're wrestling with sin. I often have felt like the Apostle Paul in my own struggle with sin. I call this the doo-doo passage, and you'll understand in a second. Romans 7, verses 15 to 25. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do... It is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I find in myself, sorry, so I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now you understand why I call it the do-do passage. But we've been there, right? The things that we don't want to do, we continue doing. The things that we want to do, we can't seem to get the motivation or we can't seem to carry out those things. There's this law at work in us. And I love the way that he puts it there. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. And I wonder if our definition of sin needs to come from some of this sort of language. That it's not really about listing off all of the things and having a checklist. That sin is actually more insidious than that. Sin is actually something that it, it's at work in each one of us. And it takes our, all that we have and all that God can do in us. Like, I love how he says, what a wretched man I am. Like, how do we end this thing? Thanks be to God, it's Jesus who delivers us. But we don't do it in our own strength. It is Christ who is alive and working in us. But there is a battle going on. There should be a battle going on in our hearts. There should be us wrestling with what is the way of Jesus and what is the way of my own flesh. What is the thing that I want to do that's going to make me look good or sound good or or make a name for myself? And what's going to make Jesus famous? What's going to make his kingdom come and his will be done? Because if it's just about me, if it's just going to feed me, if it's just going to please me, perhaps that's sin at work in me. 
What if defining sins isn't the best way to deal with sin in our lives? What if becoming holy is less about avoiding certain behaviors and more about pursuing wholeness and freedom? Because I think sometimes we've been caught up a little too much in the minutia of trying to define what is sin and what is not, instead of looking at sin a little bit more holistically. Like, I wonder if attempting to name individual sins rather than big sin, not sins, but sin, by doing that, we've missed the mark. Because sin is that. Sin is missing the mark. And the mark for us is be holy as I am holy. The mark for us is perfection, which we know we're going to fall short of. But that's what we're aiming for. So if holiness and wholeness are the goal, anything that pulls us away from that is sin. Anything that pulls us away from that has the ability to break down relationship with God and with others. And that's what sin does. Sin hurts us. I wonder if in our attempt to list things off and, you know, having the like, well, I don't do this and I don't do this and therefore I don't have sin in my life. I wonder if our efforts to categorize and rank and manage like the sin that we've, we've missed the mark. What if we saw sin for something bigger than just the bad deed that we did? What if it's the thing behind the deed? What if sin is that thing that motivated us to say that cruel thing about somebody? What if sin is that thing that motivated us to gossip about our friend? What if sin is somehow more subtle and more insidious? What if when God asks that question, do you realize what you've done? Barbara Brown Taylor says this. She says, deep down in human existence, there's an experience of being cut off from life. There is a memory of having been treated cruelly and a little deeper, perhaps, the memory of having treated someone else cruelly as well. Deep down in human existence, there is an experience of seeing the light and turning away from it, either because it is too beautiful to behold or because it spoils the dank but familiar darkness. Deep down in human existence, there is an experience of reaching for forbidden fruit, of pushing away loving arms, of breaking something on purpose just to prove that you can. Deep down in human existence, there is an experience of doing whatever is necessary to feed and comfort the self because there is no one else to trust. There is no other purpose to serve. There is no other God to follow. For ages and ages, this experience has been called sin deadly alienation from the source of all life. This is what sin is. Sin is that thing that separates us. It separates us from God and it separates us from one another. So whether we do the pushing away, whether we're the ones who do the hiding, whether we do it consciously or not, sin is that thing that breeds alienation. And it can take on so many forms. That's why I'm not sure that it's helpful to try and list them all off because you will never get to the end of the list. There will always be things in my heart and in yours that need to be wrestled with and dealt with. And I'm not sure that it's helpful for us to make lists for each other. It might be helpful for us to make lists for ourselves. Like, what are those things that separate you from God and from others? Is it your anger? Is it your judgment? Is it your gossip? Maybe it's your drinking. Maybe it's your addiction. Maybe it's the porn that you watch. Maybe it's the comments that you make online. Maybe it's all of those things. Maybe it's none of them. Maybe I haven't hit the right thing on your list. But sin is bigger than the list. What if we took hold of everything that caused us to turn away from the light and called it for what it was? That's sin. That's the thing that's causing me not to experience wholeness, not to experience the shalom, the very presence of God. What if we recognize those things in our lives that cause us to hide, that cause us to not be our whole selves when we come into a conversation? What if we just named that? What if we called it what it is? That's sin. What if we looked at the things that break down relationship between us and God and our neighbors and confessed it as sin? Because confession is more meaningful than management. And one of the things I think we've been guilty of is trying to manage sin. We've tried to put up a good fight. And what we've done is we've put on a mask and we've made it look like we've got our crap together when we don't. None of us do. All of us are wrestling with sin. 
But here's the good news. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's not saying if you cover them up, if you keep them well hidden, if you somehow manage them, if you just try and avoid eight out of ten times doing it. No, just confess. Confess your sin. More important, important than just avoiding certain behaviors, confession is the part of our journey that leads us to wholeness. God hates sin. And sometimes I feel like we've missed the reason why he hates sin. God hates sin because of what it does to us. God hates sin because of what it does between us, how it separates us from him. But what it does between his fellow creation, God hates sin because it destroys relationships. It hurts us. God... God isn't really affected by sin. Sin can't be in his presence. He, he's impervious to sin. God is not afraid of sin like he's going to somehow be tainted by our mess. If God wanted to deal with sin in a really dramatic way, he would just wipe us all out. But it's because of his love. It's because he has this grace for us. God hates sin because it wounds you. Because of what it does to you. Because it breaks relationship with him. It causes you to think, God doesn't want me. God doesn't want to be in relationship with me. It puts this barrier between us. It destroys relationship. And he wants you. He wants you whole. He wants you to be in relationship with him and with each other. God's design is for perfect peace. It is for shalom. It is for wholeness. Perfection. God is wanting to bring us back to the garden. Back where we had perfect relationship. Where we didn't need to realize what we had done. And so one day God is going to destroy sin. One day he's going to set everything right. And we're not going to have to have this wrestling inside of us. But until that day comes, we need to recognize what sin does in our hearts what it does in our lives, how it affects us as individuals, it, it, the lies that it tells us, the things that work through our minds that uh, go contrary to the word that God has poured into us, what it does with our relationships with other people, what it does with our relationship with God. When we seek to know God and live in his ways, we will inevitably bump into sin in our lives. One of my favorite quotes by C.S. Lewis is talking about the fact that we will be messy and tattered children when we finally reach heaven. But the good news is the bath is drawn. The towels are laid out. You're going to find the mess. It's when we recognize the dirt in our lives that God is most present in us, is what C.S. Lewis said. And it's in those moments where we can confess our sin. And he's faithful. He's just. This sacrifice that was made on our behalf washes us clean. And we're restored in a right relationship with God and with others. If, if we're willing to confess our sin, to ask for forgiveness of those who we've hurt, we restore relationship. We ask God to help us to walk in a new way, to, to change, to, to make a new path. And that's what next week's going to be about. Repentance. About making a change. It's not just about saying we're sorry, but it's actually living into a different set of ideals. Step one is recognizing that if, even if we don't love the word, even if it's fallen out of fashion, even if people don't use the word sin as much anymore, it's still a reality. And it's something that is waging war in your heart and mine. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ has delivered us. Sin is a reality. And it's something that may keep us from experiencing the shalom of God. But when we turn to Christ, we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us all our sin to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. There are some tough words to swallow that I find in Scripture, Lord. There are things that bump up against my flesh, that bump up against my... Um, my understanding, my wishing the way the world worked that it does, the way that it does. There are some tough words to swallow, and sin is one of those for me, Lord. I don't like to think that I've fallen short. I, I don't like to think that I've, that I've hurt others or that I've separated myself from you. And I, and I like to think I'm a pretty good guy. 
but I also recognize, just like the Apostle Paul did, that there's, there's this thing at work in me that, that wants to thwart your ways, that wants to undermine and undercut the kingdom at work in and through me, that, that wants to cut off the, the, the work of Jesus and, and cause me to fall short and to give up and to, and to just curse others or, or, or to set out on my own path. And Lord, this morning, I, I want to I call that thing, that, that stuff that's at work, whether it's evil, whether it's sin, I, I want to call it that. I want to call a spade a spade. I want to say that sin is at work in me, and, and I confess it. To you this morning, God, I confess that I, I want to walk in wholeness. I want to walk in holiness. And so for those things that are rolling through my mind right now, for those things that are rolling through the minds of my friends who are gathered here today, Lord, I pray that we would would confess those things to you and that you would forgive us and that you'd help us to turn and walk in a different way. Lord, will we keep falling into the same pit, where we keep falling into the same hole, doing the same things, those things that we don't want to do, we find ourselves doing, I pray that you would give us victory over them. I pray that as we continue to confess and recognize the damage that it's causing in our own hearts and our relationships, that we would choose a different way. So Lord, help us to recognize sin in our lives and to confess it, that we may walk in greater wholeness. And next week as we talk about repentance, Lord, teach us what it means to be people who live an attitude of repentance. So God, have your way this week as we continue to um, be your ambassadors in this world, that we desire to be people who reveal Jesus wherever we go. Help us to be people who walk in greater wholeness, we pray. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, I went a little long this morning. I apologize for that. I pray that you guys have an amazing week. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen. Last chance for nominations at the back there. If you want to nominate somebody for our leadership team, please do so before you head out today. Have an amazing week. Amazing.